thing, especially with the pharmacies that you see and everything that goes with it. And you see even back to the fountains, things like that. Uh, this has been a, a work in progress for, for some time now that, as you know, Pam, where's Pam? She went that away. She went that away. So she went to hide. Uh, there she is. Pam is our vice president, and she is the committee chair for education, which is responsible for all of our exhibits, along with Melinda. Well, don't hide now, the treasure. Maureen, curator. They have all of this, and they have worked really hard to put all this back together again, so to be able to feature this particular exhibit. And again, we thank you for your time this morning, and I will not take long. One of the things that we do, this is the time of year to do it, and every year, is our membership drive. So if you have a chance, grab the, uh, the uh, brochure, please help us out. Don't forget, we are the nonprofit. We are part of the uh, Rancis Pathways, along with Pat, raise your hand. Pat's our, one of our great docents that helps out, but she's also your county commissioner. And so, we, and so don't forget, it takes a, it takes the village to keep this house moving. That's right, amen. Okay, and so this is one of the things that we have stressed. Now, yes, we're the baby, we're the infant of the nonprofits because the Friends of the History Center is only 12 years old. History, the, the historical society, all that goes all the way back in time. But the people that actually run the facilities are your friends of the History Center. And without them, well, they would be, you would not be here today. And that's why we really appreciate everyone's support of, of, of the programs and the exhibits that we do. So, with that in mind, we have Mike Johnson, Dave Rubin, and Mr. Blue. They are going to introduce themselves, tell them a little about themselves and the properties or wherever they work or own, and they will get into some other discussions on, the, on a, a round table uh, of things that uh, led to what you see uh, this morning. So, Mr. Johnson, would you please? Please call me Mike. Okay, Mike. <laughs> so, it goes back a long way. Uh, to give you a little background on my family, uh, uh, Captain Charlie, which is Theodore Johnson, and his wife came over from one Germany in Denmark. And uh, <clears throat> Captain Charlie ran the middle boat in, in the ferry back and forth between Indianola and Rockport and Rangis Bay. And then one of his children, Charles G. Johnson, uh, became the president of the bank here in Rockport back in the early 1900s. And then my father was born, and, and basically uh, my grandmother died when he was five years old, and then my, his, his father, Charles G., died when he was 17. So then he moved to, uh, with a brother, to Sinton, and he worked in the drugstore, and that's where he got his training. And then in 1946, uh, <clears throat> let me back up a little bit, he married uh, my mother, uh, who was from Sitton, and then they moved back to Rockport. In 1946, then, he bought the store. This is the one on the bottom. Now, that's not the way it looks. <laughs> uh, you know, before, before, it had wooden floors, no air conditioning, uh, it had... You know, I remember as a kid sweeping it with, with, you had this sawdust product that had some kind of oil in it. It aired a single night when it closed, and then you had to sweep it. Then in, in the mid-50s, he remodeled the store to look like this. And, it, you know, now it, it had terrazzo floors, it had air conditioning. Uh, so. It, it's a long history of that way, and, and there there is a uh, an article uh, that was written right after he bought this store uh, that talked about uh, uh, this came out in the Rockport Pilot. It, it talked about now the war is over and we can get goods into the store, and it talked about we've got 
three packages of chewing gum. <laughs> we've got some batteries for your flashlight. And we've got some cigars. And most important, we have cigarettes and whiskey. <laughs> so, so, you know, and that was right after the war. And then, then fast forward, uh, you know, he got rid of the soda fountain because the soda fountain didn't make any money. I mean, it was, it was a loser from the day one. Uh, and then when they remodeled the store, they did not put the soda fountain back. So, anyway, but I'll let David tell a little bit more of the story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stand for up. I'm going to stand up. I, I just wanted to show you how much taller I am. Well, let's see. I'll start. I'll kind of go start at the beginning. Uh, my history here in our family history doesn't go near as far back as Mike's does or Jerry Brundritz or, or many others that are here today. But uh, basically our, our history here started in about 1947. So I guess a year after uh, uh, your dad bought the store. Yeah, 46, yeah. Uh, my, my mother and father met at Tower Pharmacy at Six Points in Corpus Christi. Anybody know where that is? Yeah. Yeah. None of that's there anymore. But I mean, six points, I guess, but it's changed considerably. But there was a, a tower pharmacy was there, and uh, my mother worked at board at the Borden's company on Air Street, way down, miles down. Anybody familiar with that? Remember the old Borden's? Well, she she and her friends used to walk from Borden's to Tower Pharmacy to eat lunch. And then walk back. I don't know if they got an extra long uh, lunch period or what. But anyway, that's where uh, my mom and dad met. He was a pharmacist. He graduated in 1937 from the pharmacy school at UT in Austin. And uh, so he, I don't know if that was, it may have been his first job there at Tower Pharmacy. Anyway, he spied her and she was a little cute, little less than five feet tall person. And, uh, and his dad, <laughs> my dad's my dad's name is Shelley. Was well, Shelley? Uh, her name was Lahoma, which is hard to forget. Uh, and her middle name, since she's not here, because it always made her mad when I said it. But her middle name is Maud, and she didn't like Maud. <laughs> anyway, so they met, and my dad bought her lunch at the at the fountain there. It had a fountain. And, uh, and one thing led to another, they got married. Uh, they lived in Corpus Christi for a while, and then the war came. And when the war came, uh, you know, there was, everybody was volunteering, including my father, who volunteered uh, for the Army. And the Army, and it's, uh, he was a pharmacist, and he wanted to be a medic or, uh, or be a pharmacist in the Army. And so the Army, uh, in their infinite wisdom, made him a forward field observer. <laughs> and the reason is that he could do the math. And so uh, he was, he, he joined the army, and he, you know, my mom stayed in Corpus. And he went, he ended up in Italy, and uh, he was forward field observing uh, when a mortar round hit very close to him, and it severed arteries and things in his arm. And those of you who remember, the, some of you old timers, will remember that my dad had a uh, his his hand was drawn up yeah, yeah. like this, and uh, which was very effective uh, when he wanted to get my attention <laughs> because he would those it was just skin and bones, and he would wrap me on top of the head uh, and call me uh, lard. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, if you wonder about my you know, middle issues, that I'm at. but uh, so so after the war, he was uh, after he got wounded, he went to Temple to the VA hospital, and he was there for a, over a year rehabilitating, and, and they wanted to take his arm off, and he wouldn't let him. So he kept his arm, but uh, you know, minimal. He could use it for some things, but he had to learn to write with his left hand. He had to learn to type with his left hand. And in the pharmacy, he used an old Smith Corona 
standard non-electric and he could type faster than most anybody with just one hand hunting back like this and because back then you know the pharmacists typed all their own labels and uh, stuck them on the bottle or, or rolled them up to put them inside you all remember that mm -hmm. and uh, so he got real good at that but uh, after the war, uh, he was looking for a place to, to go and buy. He wanted to have his own pharmacy. So he found out about this one in Rockport. And uh, at the time, this, the drugstore that he bought was located down near Estelle Stair, where the, the brick buildings are. Well, he had the next, the, if you're facing Estelle Stairs to the right, uh, by the way, Estelle Stairs was uh, uh, Sorensen's dry goods, and Paul Sorensen was also the weatherman. <laughs> he lit, he raised the flags when there was a hurricane, and uh, so my dad bought the store right next to it. And it was at the time it was called uh, Ballard Drugstore, but it was owned by Mr. Doctor Brewer. Uh, anyway, some kind, of, not sure Doctor Brewer was actually a doctor, but. At any rate, uh, the community elevated him to Dr. Hood. <laughs> and, uh, and so my dad bought that store, and it was an old, real high ceilings. I think Jack might have worked there a little bit. Uh, a little bit. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, at some point, he decided to move out of that building and into the new facility, which is this one, which now looks like that. <laughs> but at the time it looked like this and if you look at this picture this was a promotional picture and you can see hula hoops <laughs> hula hoops hula hoops were the thing when yes. this picture was taken yes. which is really cool and then the interior is the uh, he, he, he did put a soda fountain in I guess he liked soda fountains he did like soda fountains so he put that in and just like Mike said it never made any money, and so he complained about it from beginning to <laughs> all the way through. But, you know, like, uh, but it drew people in, and uh, those of us who grew up around here uh, know that uh, that was a meeting place, a focal point for the community at the time. And uh, we all went there. I mean, we left high school and drove to the fountain to eat lunch. Uh, that was when the open campus. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you. Just yeah, go ahead. My mother and dad forbid me to go to that. <laughs> I would say down there. I love that. And that brings up something else that uh, we were discussing up here amongst ourselves. We all, all of us. Uh, had the uh, privilege of running drugs back and forth from one drugstore to the other. <laughs> if somebody would run out of a certain drug, then uh, we'd get sent. I got, I got sent many times. And when I, I was, I was probably a little guy at the time. And uh, I, there, there's a funny story uh, about this because uh, Joe Johnson was at the drugstore and I ran down there and I heard about this because he reported back to my father. <laughs> but I ran down there to take something to Johnson's, and uh, Joe was there. And uh, I, I announced to him that my daddy owned the big store down the street. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he said, he patted me on the head. Yeah. <laughs> Go run along home. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, those were uh, those were really interesting times back then. That's back when we didn't have to lock our doors and we left our keys in our car. And you can't imagine even think about it, anything like that now. But uh, I know one of the questions that I was asked to address was the operation of the drugstore. And uh, well, the drugstore was open from eight in the morning till eight in the evening, every day including Sunday. So, uh, and for much of the, uh, the history of the drugstore, my dad was the only pharmacist down there a lot of the time. Now, sometimes uh, he, there were some 
Now, some of you may remember Joe Wright. Joe Wright worked in the pharmacy with my dad for a long time. Uh, really a nice, great gentleman. Uh, and then he, but then other than that, he just had sporadic helpers. Otherwise, it was just him. So finally, in their, they got together, their heads together, Johnson's and Rokas, and decided, let's take turns being open on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why it took them so long, but, they, but they, eventually they, they started, uh, you know, my dad would get one uh, Sunday off every two weeks. And uh, uh, I don't know about the employees at, at Johnson's, but at Roden's drugstore, they were steadfast. That's right. Jack, I remember, Jack was there, uh, and he remembers the ladies that worked for my dad. I don't know what my dad, he must have given them a good Christmas present, <laughs> because, or bonus, because they uh, stayed with him forever, mm -hmm. all the way through. Yeah. Ruth Stryker. Mm -hmm. uh, Martha Armentrout, Lucy Davis, uh, Ruth Mills, who was uh, the, mo the mother of the, the guy who's running for sheriff again. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they were totally loyal to him. And then Miss Schoonover ran the fountain. And Norlene Hesseltine worked back there in the fountain. My brother worked in the fountain. I refused to work in the fountain. Because uh, I found, when I found out they were that a guy was called a soda jerk, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to be a, a jerk. So anyway, I, I refuse to. Uh, but uh, let's see, what else? What else do I need to talk about? What have I not? What have I neglected to say? Oh, the other drugstore burned. Oh, oh, oh yeah! I forgot that the original uh, drugstore that was downtown next to Estelle Stair was one of one of three that I'm aware of spectacular fires in Rockport, Texas. Some of y'all remember? Uh, it, it, uh, this entire uh, town, the community of the peninsula, everybody came to watch the fires. Yeah. It was a it was a grand show. <laughs> it was a big, big, big. You know, which was tragic, but Man, it's, yeah, I there may have been vendors there selling popcorn. They, they, everybody showed up, including me, and I watched uh, that store down, down there, that brick facade store burn up one night, and we were all standing out in the street watching. And the other was, uh, I remember that. you remember that? And you, then you'll also remember uh, Ricego. Yeah. Was it was another one that burned up? Mm -hmm. and it was the same thing. The whole sky was lit up, yeah. and then uh, Jackson, 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 Jackson seafood and the boathouse. Yeah. And uh, I still remember the boats, <coughs> uh, old, yeah. old cabin cruisers, Chris Crafts, oh. big mm -hmm. ones uh, that burned through their moorings, the ropes, and they drifted out into the harbor. I never, it's one of those things you don't forget. And those, those boats were out there burning in the harbor, and that was they, they were mostly uh, gas, I guess, because they were blowing up. Yeah. You remember this? So uh, I thought I'd try that. It's a little, a little extra history. Uh, any questions for me, or anything I've forgotten to say? I want to add a few things. Okay. Um, come on up. Come on up. Here, here, here. Stand up. Stand up. So about the operation. The operation of the drugstores were really kind of archaic back then, to say the least. Uh, my mother and dad would have a charge account set up where if you wanted to buy anything uh, at the store, you want to pay for it, you sign a little tap. And every month, every month, my mother and dad would sit down and go through each one of these things for the, each family. And that's the way it worked. And basically, you know, Rockport had good times and Rockport had bad times. Mm -hmm. And the stripping business was bad, it just filtered down. You didn't get paid. You had to wait till the next year. And so that, that was really, I think, a real burden. The other, the other thing I remember is that in order to get product to put on the shelves, 
you know, you had a salesman that came from Corpus Christi, Southwestern Drug Company, mm -hmm. I think that's the name of it. Exactly. Same sales guy. <laughs> and he would go out and he would inventory everything on the shelves. And you know, my, my dad liked to have a good time and he ribbed him all the time. And the poor, I really felt sorry for the guy. Anyway, he would go back to Corpus Christi in the next week, come in with all the stuff that he needed. And so, anyway, uh, the, the, the one thing about my, my dad, and he loved to have a good time. I don't think he was a druggist, to say the least. Back then, I didn't know whether you had to have a license to be a druggist. But he, he learned the business, and then finally, uh, he was told he had to have a druggist, period. And so, Babe, Babe Ekman yeah. was retired, and he came to Rockport, and he became the druggist. Hmm. And uh, you know, it was it was a good it was a good experience growing up to all of that. Uh, and I'd say that my father had uh, a like to have a good time. I hadn't shown this to Pam, but he ran for. County agitator. Agitator. The inscription in here says, my platform, more agitation to more people during my term of office. <laughs> Over 40 years experience in agitating in Texas. I feel confident that my record in this county is far superior to, uh, to my young an inexperienced Yankee appointment. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, he had a good time. Uh, and he had a great sense of humor. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, to continue on my story as well, uh, after the store was renovated uh, in 1956, uh, my dad and mother kept running it, and my dad passed away in 1960. He was 54 years old. So my mother kept the store going with the pharmacy uh, until uh, we leased it out to a, a real pharmacist <laughs> in, in, by the name of Bob Eschberger. Oh, yeah. And so the idea was to lease it for a period of time with his right to buy it after that. And so my mother said, you know, that's fine. You know, and she worked at the store. They kept the name uh, for a period of time. Uh, but then after that, I had graduated from high school and went to college. And I kind of never came back uh, to the store. I, I did see it uh, between my sophomore and junior year, right before I was getting ready to go back to College Station. Uh, Carla, I think, was the the storm that hit. And I remember waiting down Austin Street at the eye of the storm when it was calm and seeing the storm surge. And it was in the stores and I mean it was it gutted a lot of a lot of places. But then uh, after that, you know, I, my experience like yours is has been great growing up here. I loved it. <coughs> you tell your story. Well, I feel like an interloper here. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, never. never. Right. My role here is to talk about my, my yes, experience. Who wrote this? Who wrote this? Thank you. I don't want to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you uh, can't help it. Get in here. <laughs> I was. I worked there during high school a little bit, and then the first year or two out of college, in college, in Corpus, and. I was basically a, a sweeper of the floors and operated the cash register some. And I don't think I ever did any soda jerking back there. I <laughs> 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 didn't find out the damage. <laughs> um, so uh, I, all I can do right now is share a little bit of the experiences I had. Uh, these kids came down to the store frequently and running around. Um, in the way. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll admit. <laughs> I'm amazed that you were able to come up with the names of the ladies there. I was. Yeah. I had a couple of them, but I couldn't get all of them like you did. Yeah. That's impressive. 
Um, but those ladies were like mothers to me in some ways, and I appreciated that in those days. But a, few, a couple of things I remember, your daddy back there operating that typewriter, and he was using, using what was left of his arm over here yeah. to move the carriage back and forth yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. He'd get to the end of the line, he'd do that, type some more, and then roll it up yeah. so he could type the next line on that label. And um, Mr. Wright was, he had used to both of his arms, of course, and he was uh, okay on that. Um, now I'm forgetting some things that I did want to mention. Um, sorry, y'all. This isn't going to look good on the tape. I know that's right. <laughs> I've had a health issue that's causing my brain to not work well. Um, so uh, I'll just I'll just leave it there. I'm not going to stand here and embarrass myself and take y'all's time to. Oh, <coughs> no way. I'm sorry. Go okay. ahead. This this is a continuation of, well, of the storytelling and some of the things that. Uh, verbiage you've used between a druggist and pharmacist, pharmacist mm -hmm. with that obviously no license license you, you want to get into any of the technical details of just so it was evolving and the state was getting more involved in the regulation of and yeah. there you go yeah. so it was just in, in process but I, I, it sounds like to me it must have been transitioning during the fourth, uh, that's the way I remember it as well. I mean, that, you know. I remember my dad uh, would would fill a prescription, and, and you talk about compounding and things like yeah. that. Yeah. He he knew that how to how to do that, and then finally, whenever this transition was happening, and the people from the state, as I recall, came in and said, "Joe, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to have somebody that's licensed." And so that's when, at that point in time, that's when Babe Ekman <coughs> came in, and thank goodness, <laughs> and it made, made things legal, I guess, is the way you could say it. But, anyway. What about know, deliveries? Did y'all do deliveries? I'm sorry? Deliveries. That was me. You, you just, yeah. that was uh, that was Jack. I remember your, your that daddy had that old 51 Ford or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got to drive that around carrying, <laughs> carrying prescriptions. Yeah, you did a lot of those, didn't you? Yeah, and then I'd go down to y'all store. I, yeah. I was the carrier back and forth yeah. <coughs> to uh, borrow so, drugs. So you tell him you came from the big store down the street? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get into that. <laughs> on, on another technical end, most probably y'all were young, but with the, with the doctors, how they relay <coughs> prescriptions, or was it all in the pattern where they wrote a script? <clears throat> so what I what I remember, yes, it was. You you would go to Dr. Elliot or Dr. Wood, and he would write out the prescription, and then to that person, and that person would take it to the drugstore, and then they would get filled that way. But but back in the back in those days, I mean, Dr. Elliot, I don't I don't remember Dr. Crone. Who, who I think lived uh, off a of little bay, right on the right on the highway. Uh, but I don't remember anything about his practice. Uh, I do remember uh, Dr. Wood, who had his office uh, directly across the street from uh, from our store, and he, he, had, his, he had his clinic, and he lived above. He and his wife lived above the clinic. Uh, Dr. Elliot, on the other hand, lived, uh, had his clinic with, right, right next to Rodens, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. or right behind it. Right there. Uh, and, you know, back in those days, Dr. Elliot would do house calls. I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd be sick. Yeah. And the next thing I know is, you know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Dr. Elliot shows up in his car. That's the way it was done. Yeah, so Dr. Woods did house calls as well. Yeah. Mm. So was there communication between your doctors and your 
your pharmacies or, or with some just I, I strips think or you know how how everything evolves now is all electronic and yeah, fax yeah. and you never you never it was a, it was the old telephone mm -hmm. the old style you pick up and talk on and, uh, <laughs> I, I know my dad uh, the one thing about uh, doctors is that they're, they're notorious for not being able to write for spell yeah. or anything you can't read the writing right. <laughs> so it was it was a daily thing for the pharmacist to have to call the doctor and say, and very gently uh, say, uh, doctor, could you help me with this uh, wording here? I can't quite make it out. And uh, so they'd figure out what it was the doctor wanted because it, it was illegible. Uh, and then you'd you know, start, filling the, start filling the prescription and stick it on one of those, those things that sticks up, you know, they, Spindles. That's where the prescriptions went when they were built on that thing. So I, I, I think too that that both Dr. Wood and Dr. Elliot uh, tried to be as fair as they could be between the two pharmacies. Either you were a customer of Roten's or a customer of Johnson, but then there were people out there that weren't customers at all. And I think I think they tried their best to be as fair as they could. Uh, Bill about the prescriptions to one to the other. Right. And then with Doc Brule, what was his, he worked in? Well, he he was elderly when, my, I guess, okay. when my dad bought the store yeah. from him. Yeah. 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 He had, in that same, that same brick building, the, the drugstore was on the bottom floor. His <laughs> office was on the top, oh, okay. uh, above. Right. And uh, uh, I don't know, I don't remember ever seeing him. I may have, I probably did, but uh, uh, yeah, he was already pretty elderly, but he concocted, uh, I think he was a pharmacist, and he, he uh, came up with all kinds of remedies that he uh, formulated himself, and my dad bought a bunch of those from him when he bought the drugstore, and uh, I, the only one I remember is Brill's Lip Cure. <laughs> and I'm sure you've all used that. <laughs> but uh, eventually they kind of went away because people didn't, you know, they were buying uh, ready-made stuff and they didn't go for that as much anymore. So, But he had, I don't know, how many, four or five different uh, uh, patents that he bought from Dr. Brule. And uh, they were there on those shelves and, you know, if you knew where to find them, and I guess the old timers did. Yeah. But uh, I've got, uh, I have a funny story. You, I've got four. Okay. Well, uh, this is where the rubber hits the road. Okay. Uh, my dad, and uh, we haven't mentioned Dr. Patillo, but many of you yeah. remember Dr. Yeah. Patillo. His name was, it was posted up there. It's uh, GM. <laughs> Patillo. <coughs> Does anybody, some of you old timers, you, do you know what GM stood for? No. It was on the diploma. I read it. Are you ready? Gibson Magnate. What? His name was Gibson Magnate Patillo. So can you see why he went by GM? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the connect. And my, my father and, uh, and, and GM were good buddies, real good friends. And uh, uh, and one thing that they had in common, you know, there's a bond in the medical community. They were both rabid smokers. Yeah. <laughs> they both liked to smoke. Sorry, sorry to tell you that about, you know, a doctor or a pharmacist, but, but they liked to smoke. And my dad eventually gravitated to cigars. And uh, there was he, he kept cigars in the drugstore and he every now and then he'd run short and he'd go grab a handful and take them back to the pharmacy. Yes, he smoked in the pharmacy. <laughs> yes, he smoked when he was filling prescriptions. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes he would smoke them down to little nubs and they he'd, he'd put them there on the counter. And so if you, you know, if you ever go in there and look, you'd see all these little burn marks along there. <laughs> Cigar. 
So, and eventually it would go out, but he would still, he would still stick it in the corner of his mouth. Some of you may remember him like that. He'd just stick that cigar in the corner of his mouth and he'd be counting pills. <laughs> and he had his little plastic device and he'd pour the pills out there and he'd use the spatula, five, 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 and he'd count them up and pour them in the deal. And, but sometimes the ashes would come <laughs> off, off the cigar and they would fall in the little breeze cabin. <laughs> He'd look around, sweep them up, <laughs> and you go right on him. <laughs> well, and they get real busy sometimes, you know. A lot of, a lot of prescriptions to fill back in the, that day. Probably not so many now as compared to now. But they, I mean, he, all day long he did this, stood there and, and he did this. And every now and then a pill would, would uh, escape from the little bin. And it would it would roll across the counter, and it would drop down on the floor. And there was a uh, he had he had a rubber mat back there with holes in it. Well, he knew what to do in the, in a situation like this because pills are money. So he had a pair of tweezers, and he would I would, I stood there many a time, and, and he'd turn and look, he'd look at me, and he'd say. It fell on a clean piece of paper. <laughs> and then he reached down, he grabbed that, grabbed that pill, <laughs> put the lid on. <laughs> so confession time. Yeah. You know. uh, but I, I just wanted to share that with you. And, and also, uh, I, and this is kind of a, 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 sad, a sad note. Sorry to, I may be bringing this all to a conclusion, but Richard Beck. Uh, bought the drugstore for my dad uh, back in the 80s and uh, I just we just discovered that Richard had passed away uh, just recently and uh, so uh, and he, after he bought it he stayed there at that location he eventually closed the fountain because it didn't make any money <laughs> but anyway, uh, and, and then eventually he moved the store out across from Panjo's and the strips of, until it went away uh, and I think he took a lot of those same ladies with him out there you know, they, followed him. they were loyal these, these ladies were so anyway I just wanted to mention that about Richard's passing mm -hmm. that uh, you know one of the things that amazed me, and you were just talking about this. Is, you know, back back then, they had a, a flat piece of platter with a little tube on it, and that's what they took the pills and they counted those. Yeah. You go to Walgreens today, yeah. that same thing, they still, same method, and I same. I mean, it's exactly the same. In fact, two days ago, I went to our HEB pharmacy and I said, you know, those little pill counter things. I said, I'm going to have to give a speech in Rockport Saturday. Um, and would you mind lending me that? No. They wouldn't do it. They would not do it. I said, you can go online. And for $8.99, you can get it. But I was not willing to spend $8. <laughs> Everybody knows what it is. That's a lot of money. My dad did. My dad graduated in 1937, I think, from UT Med uh, Pharmacy School. That was that was the, the transition period that, that right. was supposed to, but it wasn't. Yeah, required. It, wasn't, yeah. Laws it was changing. required, but it, it wasn't okay. enforced. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Dave, did you know your daddy was impatient at times? Uh, yes. I do. I told you he wrapped up my head with his hand. <laughs> well, I remember after after Hurricane Carl, you mentioned that thing, yeah. Mike Moore Hill. Uh, our we live just off Austin Street, just just where the, you make the right turn and go out Market Street. We used to live right down there a little ways. And so Carl flooded our house like he did all of downtown. And so my focus was helping get our house cleaned out so we could live in it. But your daddy was down there expecting me to show up down there and help him clear, clean the store out. 
Yeah, we did it. Put it in the water. So, uh, I think a day or two after I returned, he rounded me up and reminded me that I was an employee of that store. <laughs> and that I therefore should be out I, I, I am so sorry. I didn't realize <laughs> it. was a tyrant. I'm just, I'm just making, it doesn't, I don't mean to make it sound that way, but it was clear. Yeah. yeah, I was expected down there to help mop floors and like, you know, help get you out of the water. Oh, it was a mess, too. Another thing I remember about him, uh, you, you may recall this, uh, we had, he had a, a magazine rack or whatever you call it. It's right there. It's in the oh, yeah. 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 Right here. You don't see any playboys up there in that place. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very common for the people who supplied those magazines to supply adequate supply of play, Playboy, etc. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I remember frequently he he'd go through that pile of magazines, the latest shipment, and take the trash out of it and the Playboy, etc. Yeah. So he could have a clean magazine rack that, without that going on. Uh, uh, <laughs> different day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now you wouldn't have a magazine rack without that, I guess. <laughs> 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 It'd be successful. <laughs> uh, those uh, comic books, magazines, are. Uh, I wish we'd known if we kept those things because they'd be worth a fortune. <laughs> but they're gone. One little bitty thing I learned there was when you operate a cash register, the dollar bills go in there a certain way. They don't go in there upside down or right. There is a right side up and a right in. You put it in. Was that one of my dad's edicts too? Uh, yeah. <laughs> he had to count that all, all that money later, or your mother did when she yeah. came in. With one hand. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he he was yeah. he was particular, but uh, as an employee, I always had great respect for him. Yeah. And for Mr. Wright, yeah, they were just, they were they were, people. they were wonderful people. They were, and I could see from my position how the community respected him, mm -hmm. and uh, and they appreciated him. Yeah, and uh, I, I did personally as well. Very much. Okay, we have one more. Uh, we're going to recognize Doc Brewer in his early days. Because we probably walked into the front porch, you saw the Dr. Pepper, part of the formulation. Pam is going to go through. Doc Rule in his early years. Well, you can see we tried to track all of the history, both for the doctors and for the drugstores. And Doc Brule was here in the 1800s, and he also, um, what the way that the story is told by Gladys Gibson, who was a granddaughter, is that he trained in Waco in um, the 1890, 1891, and in that drugstore is where they invented Dr. Pepper. So, um, you know, the story sort of goes on that Dr. Burrell had a part in that. We're, we like that story. It's really interesting. So, there's Dr. Pepper out there for you to sample. Um, and it's certainly grown since the 1800s, hasn't it, in popularity. But Dr. Burrell was uh, really significant uh, as far as uh, civic duties went, as many of the different doctors and pharmacists were. And um, he didn't run on the same platform that your dad did. <laughs> but he did serve as mayor two or three times, Dr. Burrell did. He was not a doctor. He was just called Doc because so many people came to him. Uh, there, sometimes there wasn't a doctor in town. And so he was the one who had the medication who could help people with sort of first aid remedies, I think. And um, he took over the drugstore here when he was only 19. His dad, who had the drugstore, um, was actually appointed to be ambassador to Italy at that time. So this was a significant family, really interesting in the old days of Rockport. I think really a lot of fun. One of those stories that is sort of out there, but maybe we haven't told it all. So these fellas have all contributed so, so much. They sent us pictures that we could use. 
and uh, they've sent us uh, the things that were on the fountain that you see on display up there. It's really been a lot of fun. Um, several of the doctor's families have also contributed. The Patillos have, uh, as well as Elliot. So those of you who know those two families, uh, the, I had hoped that they would have come this morning too so we could recognize them. Um, Maureen uh, Winkleman put the cases together. Sandy uh, Richards back there did one of the posters. So I know it's a little bit hard with such a crowd to see all of the things that you want to read about, but we've got a lot here. This exhibit will be open until about mid-May. So come back or certainly send your friends. We have every other Sunday we have a different talk and I'll give you a postcard for that if you haven't seen that. So we hope that you'll come back and do some of those other things with us. Yeah. While we have these gentlemen up front, does anyone in the audience have any questions or do you have any stories you would like to share? Being Yes, sir. You want me to come up there? Yeah, sorry, we we were you on Sunday. Can you tell stories about David Rope? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was real nice to you. I, but, but I, could, I, I didn't could, have to be. I know, no, David and I have been lifelong friends. We were raised a block apart. Knew his dad very well. Knew the store even when they were on the east side of Austin Street. And David and I talk about this all the time. In behind. Uh, those first tier of commercial buildings was the old original First National Bank building. It was in rubble at that time. And David and I would leave his dad's store and right next as you go south from his dad's store was the pool hall. Some of y'all remember the pool hall, Domino Hall, and everybody would hang out there. They did a lot of drinking and carrying on in there. And David and I would take a shortcut through the the domino. I never, I never went in there. Yes, yeah. And we'd go through there, and then we would play on the rubble of the old First National Bank. I mean, if kids did that today, they would be in bad shape, but that was some of the things. The other thing that I wanted to touch on on the snack bar, that have y'all ever heard of a donut sandwich? Anybody heard of a donut sandwich? Well, did you, were you ever eat one there at Rope's Drug? You take, you take a donut, you put it on the bottom, you take a big scoop of chocolate ice cream, you put it in the middle, and you take another donut and you put it on top, oh and you God. smush it down, and that was called a donut sandwich. Now, David and I, he had a car, so we could leave the campus for lunch, and we would go to his dad's store, and they had soups, they had all this healthy stuff you could have, nice sandwiches. But I, I love to get a donut sandwich, so I, that's why I have this problem now. I don't have it right here. But that was a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing that I remember about the downtown area, and they sort of both touched on it, is that every time we had a tropical storm or had a heavy rain event, uh, it would flood the downtown store. The elevation of the sidewalk was about five feet. And if we had a high tide and a heavy rain, and I know Rutten's Drugstore, I was going to ask David how many times he can remember, but they would always sandbag the front doors and the back door trying to keep the water out, but still it would weep in, David. The sandbags also help hold the water in. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a secret. <laughs> Once it, because the water's coming in. Anyway, so it gets up to about, it get as high as it was going to get, like sometimes two feet. Yeah. And it would be trapped in there by the sandbags, so we'd have to do the sandbags. So if there was a rain event or a tropical storm, they would have, Jack probably had to do this, they had to go down there and raise all the merchandise up yeah. off of the lower shelves because it was going to flood and it would ruin all the merchandise. So yeah. that was, anyway, I thought I'd throw that in Thank there. You, the donut sandwich was the main thing. Try it sometime. I never, <laughs> I never ate that donut sandwich. <laughs> 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 Story before I forget. Give a sugar rush. Get a donut sandwich. When the store was renovated in 1956, my dad put up a big sign out front of the store. I mean, it was on top of the pole. And it had Johnson's Rexall Drugstore with a big blinking light. John remembers this. 
And so <clears throat> what was happening is that the shrimp boats that were coming in from Port Aranges to Rockport would pick that up as a beacon. Mm -hmm. And so these these shrimp boats would run aground. Oh. <laughs> and so finally, after about three months, the harbor master came to Dad and said, Mr. Johnson, you gotta cut that out. <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. So no longer did it blink. It just stayed <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Because this has been really fascinating. You go right ahead. Not exactly a question, just an observation. I lived in Corpus Christi for 20 years, and there was Hamlin Pharmacy. You may be familiar with it. They had a soda fountain that was terrific. May not have made money, but it was a great place to go. But that was between the mid 80s and the mid 2000s before I moved over here. And Mr. Arnold was the pharmacist there. And there were a couple of times, and I can say this now because it's not in business, and he, he's passed away, I'm sure. But I was a regular customer, and if I had a similar problem, I used to get bronchitis all the time, I could go in there on a Saturday, and he would give me a couple pills to last me till Monday till my pharmacist would call in the order and then just deduct that. And it was that kind of caring that I think a lot of pharmacists had. And you all haven't mentioned, I mean, you've told some great funny stories, but I think the love that pharmacists had for their communities, like you see in It's a Wonderful Life, was still prevalent even into the 80s and 90s of the 1900s. Well, I, I think, too, that it was a real gathering place yes. uh, for the community. And whenever, in Rockport in particular, whenever the Walgreens or the big box store, like the HEBs or whatever, nothing wrong with that. But when that happened, the mom and pop bookstores went away. Yeah. And, and you lost that personal yeah, yeah. touch yeah. with the customer. Yeah. Good, 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 bad, and good and bad things. Uh, so I guess with this in mind, uh, Pam has passed out the uh, cards. Mm -hmm. The next, uh, it'll be the 4th of February, we'll be working on the uh, medicinal. And we've got a lot of things in the garden that's going to be discussed and how everything came together, the doc rule used, things like that. So it's going to be it's really interesting. And the one that's fascinating is coming up after that, uh, Jeff Fox is going to do the uh, health concerns of the Texas Republic. But we actually had the quarantine session out in Lorenzo's Bay until the hurricane took, took that out. But it's fascinating that how everyone had to come through and be needed quarantine and everything else. So these are some different topics of how the healing hands that are, are exhibit all this evolved. So I think we, the speakers that we that Pam has lined up is going to be really interesting. So we really your support when they make their presentations we greatly appreciate it. And again, on behalf of the Friends of the History Center, thank you guys for all that you've done. Hey, so I just yes. Because they're close friends of ours, and yeah. the, the transition in Rockport, Jerry and quite a few of us still have businesses that existed way back there and uh, came along. But seeing the industry of the druggists uh, carried forward, uh, there's two people in town that uh, are very close to us that continued after these stores actually, I guess they sold to Walmart at that point, but there was a couple that moved in, the Smolics and uh, basically continued an independent uh, drugstore, which any independent business person surviving these times has got to be something, and continued on in that uh, uh, service route until for 36 years more, and they just sold, it seemed like yesterday, but probably five years ago or it's something just like before that. Harvey. For Harvey, right. Yeah, in fact, Harvey took the building out that they, well, they had three stores, one here and one in Rangers Pass and one in Ingleside, and raised all their kids and everything. But uh, it continued that, and you can really see the difference when you don't have an independent pharmacy mm -hmm. in town. I mean, talking about the service side of it, because they continued that, but boy, now it's a tough route, and uh, the big ones can control just about everything now. Yeah. Well, that will conclude our program. We have some refreshments out of the porch. Uh, please 
you feel free to, to mingle through. You guys, you, you want to address the gentleman up here again, they'll be here. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you for spending your morning with us.